Um, well, yesterday we did a lot of ancient history, which is to say things that happened before you were born. Um, today we're going to do some modern history, which is to say, how many of you were born before 1990? Oh, okay. That's more of you than I thought. In any event, um, th things that happened when you were quite young, but which definitely should not be forgotten. Um, so today we're going to talk about the precision study of electroweak interactions, and in particular the experimental evidence for the SU2 cross U1 structure of the weak interactions. And um, it, it's, as you see, a quite interesting subject uh, not only from a theoretical point of view, but also from the point of view of the experiments, which were very beautiful. So we'll get to that in a moment. The first thing I wanted to do today is to write some, oh, let's see, before I begin, I should point to um, some references. Someone asked me yesterday if there were lecture notes. And I didn't make up lecture notes specifically for this set of lectures. However, I have on my website some lecture notes, which I asked Ms. Van Buren to refer you to. So if you go to my webpage, and then uh, this site, GGI 15, you'll find lecture notes for some lectures that I gave at the GGI earlier this year. And if you go to the analogous site called Physics 152, you'll find lecture notes for a particle physics class that I gave at Stanford. And I think if you mix and match the relevant topics, you'll find most of the information that's covered in these lectures. In particular, the Wednesday and Thursday lectures will be very similar to the lectures five and six of the GGI series. So hopefully if you want to read and see the derivation of the formulae at a slightly slower pace than I did it yesterday, that's probably a good place to look. Um, if there are some things that are missed out, you can ask me about that. Are there any questions from yesterday before I proceed? Uh, many of you ask me questions informally. That's fine. Um, but anyone have any questions that are still unanswered that you'd like to air in public? OK, well, as I say, I'll be around the whole week. So uh, take advantage of that. OK, the first topic for today is that I'd like to uh, write explicitly the formulae for the masses and especially um, partial widths and branching ratios of the W and the Z. Now the W and the Z are some of the basic objects of LHC physics. And I think those of you who want to do phenomenology probably want to actually memorize the numbers that I'm going to calculate now and just keep them in your head for handy reference. Um, it's, it's just essential to have the concrete picture of this in your mind when you do almost anything that concerns LHC. So let's start with the W. The W decays to um, E nu, mu nu, tau nu, um, U d bar and C s bar. Of course, it's not massive enough to decay to T b bar. And uh, there are also Kabibo suppressed modes that I'm not going to talk about once again uh, everything that involves a CKM angle is relegated to uh, Ligeti's lectures. Um, the partial widths for these decays are very easy to calculate. And maybe I should just do that. Um, for example, W to E plus nu. The matrix element has this G over the square root of 2 that we derived yesterday. A U dagger for the neutrino, sigma V for the electron, and a polarization vector for the W boson. Um, this quantity we can compute in a frame where the neutrino goes forward and the electron goes backward. Um, it's, I hope, well known to you that this object is equal to the square root of 2 times the polarization vector for the relevant spin. So the neutrino is left-handed, the electron is right-handed. So the polarization vector that we need is, um, oh, sorry, I should have done this the other way around. Please excuse me. Let's put the positron going forward, because that's the observable particle. 
the neutrino is left-handed, the polarization vector is this. Um, it's in the final state, so we complex conjugate it. Uh, we would dot it with a W polarization vector. And the value of that matrix element for the W polarization vector that overlaps with this is G over the square root of 2. Um, oh, and sorry, please excuse me. And then 2 uh, E electron, 2 E nu, which is MW. And then there's the square root of 2 here. OK. So that's pretty easy to find. The partial width is then given by uh, 1 over 2 mw, 1 over 8 pi, a polarization average, and um, gmw squared. And I guess that all works out to um, alpha w over 12 pi, sorry, over 12, the pi is in the alpha w times mw. And this will be basically the same for every one of these decays. So we'll get a factor of 3 here. For these two, we'll get a factor of 2 and some uh, QCD radiative correction. This factor is about 3.1. When you put everything together, you get a width for the W that's about 2.1 GeV. And that's an interesting number just to have in your head when you think about uh, the detection of the W at the LHC. There's one more very interesting, oh, that also gives you the branching ratios. So the branching ratios are about 11% for these three modes and 34% each for the hadronic modes. So very important, most of the decays of the W are hadronic. At the LHC, you can find these things when the uh, W is boosted using um, some techniques. I don't know if Michelangelo is going to talk about boosted or not. But there are techniques to, uh, to differentiate boosted Ws from jets. And so you have access to these. Uh, typically, the first round LHC analyses used only the leptonic modes and mainly just the mu. So 22% efficiency for branching into those modes. There's one more very important aspect of the W decay, which is its um, angular or polarization structure. So this is something that I was emphasizing yesterday, but now let's come back to it. Um, you can take this vector here and dot it with W polarization vectors. So for the right-handed W, the vector is this, for the left-handed W, um, in the rest frame, this. And for the longitudinal W, this. And what comes out of that are angular distributions, which would be, if this is the W direction, we bring the W to rest, and then the lepton goes off here, and theta is this angle. The angular distributions are characteristically, if you just dot these vectors into this one, 1 plus cosine squared theta, 2 sine squared theta, and 1 minus cosine squared theta. So it's very interesting. The direction of the lepton identifies the polarization of the W, which is often very important. If the W, um, for example, came from a Higgs interaction, it would typically be longitudinally polarized, and its distribution would be central in cosine theta, whereas more ordinary Ws just radiated from quarks would typically be transversely polarized. And so one can distinguish them if one can reconstruct this angle. And that's often a very important strategy when you do LHC analyses. Maybe I should remind you that these angular distributions are the same ones that appear in electron-positron annihilation. And just over here, I'd like to record these. Um, d sigma d cosine theta for electron-positron annihilation into, let's say, mu minus mu plus. depends on the polarizations of all of the fermions that are involved. If I have left-handed electrons annihilating to left-handed muons, 
this is a one plus cosine theta squared angular distribution, the uh, right-handed electrons annihilating to left-handed muons give you a one minus cosine theta squared distribution. Actually, these distributions are the same distributions as the one and the one minus y squared that appeared yesterday when we talked about neutrino scattering. It's just the same expressions in different kinematic variables. But this will be rather important to us later in the lecture. Please notice that if you have massless fermions annihilating, you can't get to the longitudinal polarization state. You always make a transversely polarized virtual uh, photon or Z boson, which then has either this or this angular distribution when it decays. So keep these formulae in mind. If I start erasing them, yell at me, and we'll come back to that. Okay. Okay. So um, maybe this is a good point to just make some notes about uh, some other parameters that maybe are, are things that are interesting to um, keep in mind, even commit to memory, to do LHC phenomenology. Um, it, it's very cool to me to write the dimensionless strength of all the interactions of the standard model. And so let me do that here. So alpha is always uh, g squared over 4 pi of the appropriate couplings. Um, I'm going to look at everything at a q squared of mz squared, which is uh, maybe a little low, but at least much more appropriate for um, LHC than the standard place of lower energies. Alpha is 1 over 128. Alpha weak, which is to say uh, g squared over 4 pi, is 1 over 29.6. Alpha prime, 1 over g prime squared over 4 pi, is 1 over 98. And um, one should add to this, alpha s is about 1 over 8.4. So it's interesting. With those numbers in your head, you have right in front of you the dimensionless strength of all of the interactions that appear at the LHC. Well, there's one more really important one, which is alpha t is yt squared over 4 pi, which is uh, 1 over 14. So the top quark is actually quite strongly coupled on the scale of the other interactions. It's not quite as strong as QCD, but um, that's also something to keep in mind. In any case, we can use these numbers to evaluate, uh, for example, the formula that I wrote here and all of the formulae that will appear later in the lectures. Yes? I'm sorry? Oh, I'm sorry. This is uh, uh, g prime squared over 4 pi. So um, the relation between this and this is tan theta w. OK. Um, OK, now, with that in mind, we can go on and um, Let's see, just extract the other uh, weak interaction parameters. Um, G Fermi over 4, well, let's see. Yesterday I wrote the relation G Fermi over the square root of 2 is G squared over 8 and W squared. So um, please excuse me, this is 1 over 2 V squared. And from that, we get directly the, at least at lowest order in Higgs interactions, the Higgs vacuum expectation value of V of 246 GeV. So that times these couplings sets the scale of everything in the standard model. Um, MW, as we saw yesterday, is GV over 2. This works out to 80 GeV. And MZ, um, is GV over 2 in the standard scheme divided by cosine theta w. This works out to 91 GeV. So part of the precision electroweak program would be to measure these two quantities extremely accurately. And we'll talk about how people do that. Eventually, um, this number 
is going to be very important to actually extract the value of sine squared theta w with maximum precision. OK, so that's a quite straightforward exercise. The next thing that we have to do, I think, is to do the analogous thing for the z. And in fact, that's very easy because the algebra of working out the matrix element is almost exactly the same. So when we look at the z matrix elements, we just have to look at this expression here and see uh, what has to be replaced. So basically, this factor of the square root of 2 no longer appears. So for the z, there's a times 2. And there's also, um, for every chiral species, this quantity qz squared, where qz is the isospin minus the charge times sine squared theta w, which we talked about yesterday. And so very quickly, then, you can get to the following formula for a z partial width. z to some chiral flavor is alpha over 6 times mz squared times qzf squared, where please excuse me, qzf is i3 minus q sine squared theta w. Okay. Now, for the w, these numbers were just 1. But for the z, it's quite different because the various members of a generation have all kinds of values of i3 and very different values of q. And so to work with this formula, it basically is interesting. Oh, and please excuse me. One more thing I left out. There's an extra 1 over cosine squared theta w in the coupling. So it belongs here. Oh, now it's the correct formula. OK. So now we need some systematics of the QZFs. And I like very much to express that in the following terms. Let's define SF to be the QZ for the left-handed particle plus the QZ for the right-handed particle squared. And I'm also going to define AF to be the asymmetry. That is the thing that's proportional to the rate of predicting the left-handed particle minus the thing that's proportional to the rate for predicting the right-handed particle over the sum of those quantities. So now it's illuminating to make a table. And so let me do that here. So I'm going to write the flavor here. The, um, oh man, I'm sorry. I boxed myself into too small a corner. I'm going to write the flavor, the QZL, the QZR, the numerical value of SF for sine squared theta w equals 0.231, which is pretty close to the correct value, and the numerical value of A sub f. The flavors are uh, neutrino, electron, U, and D, and then they're repeated for each generation. Um, here I'd have a half, here minus a half plus SW squared, here a half minus two-thirds SW squared, and here minus a half plus one-third SW squared. And then in this corner, we just drop the isospin. So these things may or may not exist, but whatever they are, they don't couple to the Z boson. Uh, SW squared, two-thirds SW squared, and one-third. Yes? OK. I'm sorry, I'll wake up sooner or later. I'm sorry. It's, uh, yeah, over here, this is correct. It's MW to the 1. OK. Good. <laughs> 
Okay, now the numerical values. So the numerical values are basically really different. Um, they're somewhat different in this column. For example, sine squared theta w is close to a quarter. So this is about a half this, sorry. So this is about a half this. This is also a half. And when you square it and add them up, you get about half the strength for a neutrino. Um, one, eight, five. So interestingly, um, the uh, neutrino, the one particle you can't see, turns out to be the particle that's most strongly coupled to the Z. I'm sorry about that, but that's the way nature works. And the asymmetries are also very interesting. Here, the asymmetry is one, of course, very difficult to observe. These two quantities are about minus a quarter and a quarter, so they're almost equal. This one's a little larger with a 15% asymmetry. Here, the asymmetries are larger, 0.67. And in this column, one third of sine squared theta w is a tiny number, and you square it. So the asymmetry is almost maximal, 0.94. And so, as opposed to the W case, where everything kind of comes out equal, the Z case is very different. Every flavor within a generation kind of has its own personality with respect to Z decays. And these numbers are, if you look at them in detail, all over the map. The numbers are all generated by this formula, which is the result of SU2 cross U1 gauge invariance. And so it would be totally amazing if you could actually measure all the numbers in this table and see if they come out right. And so this is basically what was done in the 1990s at CERN and at SLAC. Uh, one built uh, large colliders dedicated more or less specifically to this purpose and tried to do experiments that were as accurate as possible. So let me just show you here, we talked about this yesterday. Um, let me skip ahead a few slides, I'm sorry, here we go. So this is a slide that Michelangelo alluded to in his talk, but it's interesting to see what the actual data looks like. E plus E minus annihilation in QED, as you know, um, the cross section is like one over the center of mass energy squared. So basically the cross section falls off as the energy gets large. Nevertheless, at 91 GeV, there should be a Z resonance in this process, E plus E minus annihilating to Z, and you should see an enormous enhancement. And indeed, that's what the data says. Uh, the cross section goes up by a factor of 1,000, and if you build an accelerator specifically to operate at that energy, you get an enormous bonus and a large event sample. The events are basically all Zs, on-shell Zs, decaying at rest in the laboratory. And so you have the ability to test the predictions that are in this table. Um, in the 1990s, uh, this was done with two dedicated accelerators. Uh, the original version of LEP at CERN, which accumulated among four experiments 12 million Z decays and an accelerator called SLC at SLAC, which accumulated a half million Z decays, but also with a high degree of electron beam polarization, whose role we'll see as we discuss the experiments. So now um, what we can do is to, is to discuss um, how the numbers in this table lay out in terms of observables that you can actually measure in this environment, electron-positron annihilation into fermion pairs. And we'll try and get some idea of how this can be viewed um, directly experimentally. Okay. So maybe the first thing to work out is uh, what are the partial and total widths of the Z numerically? Um, 
This is not so hard to do from the formula that I wrote over there after all of your corrections. Thank you very much. Um, so it's alpha w m z over 6 cosine theta w. And then the contributions are three neutrinos, three charged leptons, two up quarks, three, although I'm going to write 2.98 with some ulterior motive, uh, down quarks. The last line getting a QCD correction. And when you work it all out, you get 2.49 GeV for the Z width. Of course, this is a zeroth order with no radiative corrections. Um, but in fact, what we'll see is that this number is already in very good agreement with the experimental value. And the radiative corrections turn out also when you compute them to be relatively small. Now, how do we test this prediction? Well, probably the easiest way is to actually measure the line shape of the resonance, which is the Z. The Z appears in a propagator as 1 over S minus MW, MZ squared, um, MZ gamma Z. So it's a traditional kind of bright Wigner resonance. It's relatively narrow. This number is much smaller than the Z mass of 90 GeV. So this is a very good starting point for an analysis. However, there is an important complication, which is true for the Z and for anything that we're going to measure precisely in the future. Um, Michelangelo emphasized yesterday that the uh, DGLAP or Alter Le Parisi evolution of the initial state is very important in proton-proton scattering, but actually here it also can't be ignored in electron-positron scattering. In particular, when electron and positron annihilate to the Z, you have the possibility of radiating almost collinear photons. And these photons have logarithmically enhanced rates of production for the same reasons as in Michelangelo's talk yesterday, initial state gluons have an enhanced production by logarithms uh, in a high energy proton-proton environment. So something that you have to do is to actually compute this radiative correction and apply it to the bright finger line shape. Sorry? I, I told you I was, I was leaving something for the future in writing that. Sorry? Oh, the question was, why did I put a non-integer quantity here? And the answer is, I'm going to answer that question in about five minutes. Please excuse me. I, I just did that to tease you. But I, but I will give an answer to that question. OK. Um, so what you need to do then is to fold the bright Wigner cross-section with some appropriate parton distributions for, as it were, photons which are partons of the electron generated by the same kind of processes that Michelangelo talked about yesterday. The formula is actually very pretty. Um, it was first worked out by Fadin and Karayev. Um, the relevant parameter beta is uh, Oh, I didn't write it down. Alpha over pi times the logarithm of S, which is basically um, mz squared here, divided by the mass of the electron squared minus 1. And the formula is the integral dz of beta times 1 minus z to the beta minus 1. Um, there's some first order correction to this. There are higher order corrections as well times sigma of s times 1 minus z. Oh, sorry. Good. So a fraction z 
of the energy of either the electron or the positron is radiated in this way. This is effectively the convolution of two parton distribution functions representing these emissions. Of course, the electron is an elementary particle, so we can also compute the initial condition in the sense that Michelangelo described yesterday. And so we know this function quite precisely. In fact, the function is known to two-loop order. I didn't write the whole expression. That actually has a dramatic effect on the shape of the resonance. First of all, it basically causes the resonance to slosh out to large values and gives it a long tail. And this height is about 75% of the nominal resonance height. So it's a large effect, and you have to take it into account when you do the measurement. But when you do the measurement, so this now represents um, hundreds of man years, both on the theory side and the experimental side. You get a comparison of theory and experiment, which looks like this. Um, I always like to say this is a, a totally amazing, oh, by the way, you see those little red points? That's the data. Some of you who have sharp eyes will notice that there are error bars on those data points. Um, this is a totally amazing confirmation of the standard model because the detailed structure of this curve contains all three of the parts of the standard model. The QED, of course, through the calculation that I've just described, the uh, strong interactions through the factors of 3.1 that appear in, in, to enlarge the width of the Z, and the weak interactions, because one also has to take into account radiative corrections to this vertex, which involve W and Z. You put it all together, it just works spectacularly well. Um, here is, this is the result of the Opal experiment. Here's the official compilation of the four LEP experiments. And actually, this curve nicely shows the effect of the radiative correction, which, as you see, is an order one effect. The results are that um, the mass, that is to say the nominal resonance position, and the width of the resonance are extracted to fantastic accuracy. MZ is 91.1875 with an error of 2 MeV. The width uh, 2.4952 with an error, again, of about 2 MeV. And in exceptional agreement, even with the simplest estimate that you would get from the standard model. And maybe I should say in better agreement as you include the electroweak radiative corrections. Okay. Um, in addition to, oh, maybe I should just say, and I'll, I won't discuss this further, but those of you who'd like to discuss it offline who don't know this story, it's very interesting. To get this number with the accuracy that's quoted involves a lot of detailed accelerator physics. Um, you have to do the energy calibration of the LEP ring, which is in what's now called the LHC tunnel. It's a 27 kilometer tunnel. So you have to understand the strength of magnets uh, in a device that you built, which is macroscopically large. And some very interesting subtleties arise that I'm glad to talk to you about offline. But it's a, just a tremendous achievement to, to get to this level of accuracy in this quantity. OK. Um, in addition to the total width, one can actually uh, experimentally verify some particular partial widths. Um, the way you do that is basically you look at the events. And I think I included in these slides, I won't go through them in much detail, some typical events that were recorded by the uh, SLD experiment at SLAC. Um, those of you who know something about elementary particle detectors will immediately see that this is an electron-positron event. This event is tau production. And this event is uh, two-jet production, which is QQ bar production. Um, those of you who just can't look at it and say that, um, your background needs to be improved a little, but I'm not going to say more about that here for the moment. By the way, this is the uh, angular distribution of the quark jets measured by Aleph at the Z. This is supposed to, this function, which is, you know, just cut off at the midpoint, is supposed to be uh, one plus cosine squared theta. 
And by I, you can see that that, again, the zeroth order result, is just a beautiful fit to the data that's provided here with very high statistics. Okay. Now, some of the quantities which you can extract from the theory and then try and measure are, first of all, the leptonic fraction, that is the branching ratio to hadrons divided by the branching ratio to one lepton pair, let's say muons. Um, it's predicted by this theory at lowest order to be 20.6. The experimental value is 20.7. Uh, six, seven, with an error in the one, two, three, fourth decimal place. And another quantity which is very interesting is RB. That is to say, the branching ratio for Z to BB bar divided by the branching ratio for Z to hadrons. So here we're going to look at, pick out the events which are uh, um, jetty events, so events where the z is decaying into jets, and try and figure out what fraction of those, in, in what fraction of those does the z decay to bottom quarks. It's a somewhat interesting business, and I wanted to start by looking in more detail at one of these event pictures. Um, this is an event identified as z to bb bar. It's very hard to see from this particular event display view. What you see is just Z decaying into two jets. However, um, in the LEP experiments, and in particular in the, SL, in the uh, SLC experiment, there were precision silicon devices located a few centimeters from the interaction point. And in this particular event, the view of the tracks as measured by those devices looks like this. The scale is centimeters. And as you see, there's a fraction of a centimeter displacement. Um, for this, I guess I really do need the pointer. There's a fraction of a centimeter displacement of this vertex and this vertex from the primary interaction. Um, you all know that the lifetime of the Z, of the B quark, is one and a half picoseconds, which is to say half a millimeter. And then you get to multiply it by the Einstein time dilation. And so something that's a fraction of a centimeter away from the interaction point, which decays to a secondary vertex, um, you can identify as a bottom quark. Um, this was done very precisely at LEP. And here's uh, the distribution of that. Um, uh, unfortunately, this is in a variable called tagging variable, not centimeters. But it's the same idea. Um, something which is displaced from the origin on this plot is something which is significantly, uh, where the vertex is significantly outside the position of the primary vertex. Something that's done in this analysis, which is very interesting, is to sign the vertices. So here's the primary vertex. It produces a jet which goes in this direction. If there are tracks in the jet that extrapolate to a point in front of the vertex, you assign that as positive. If there are tracks in the jet that seem to form a vertex behind, you give this a negative sign. Um, this can occur if a bottom meson actually moves from here to here and decays. This can occur only by mismeasurement. And so if you compare the negative side of the diagram to the positive side of the diagram, you can actually measure the uh, experimental error associated with the vertex finding. Um, the uh, results are Monte Carlo for um, UDS, and then the slightly hatched region is uh, the charm quark, and then um, the bottom quark, and the whole thing is fitted, uh, the whole histogram is fitted to the data, as you see, extremely precisely. And so, oh. If I find the right piece of paper, yeah, we then get a very precise value of this quantity RB, which turns out to be uh, 0.216296. This is a composite of the four LEP experiments. Now, what's the value of RB in the standard model? Well, one can just Please excuse me, ignoring this factor here, 
just calling it 3 for the moment, um, construct RB from the quantities I've given here, and the value is 0 0.220, which is in large disagreement with this number. However, it turns out that there are some important radiative corrections that can't be omitted. Namely, the correction where the z turns into a top quark, or where the z turns into a w pair, which then by exchange of a top quark will turn into bb bar. The contribution of these diagrams is about 2%. It's proportional to alpha w times m top squared over mw squared. So it's enhanced with respect to the usual scale of one loop electroweak correction. And when you, and it's negative, so when you subtract it from this number, you get a number very close to the one that I showed here. Um, theory and experiment are about one sigma apart for this quantity. Now this is uh, something I think to raise your antennae on when you talk about beyond the standard model. Because in theories of new physics beyond the standard model, it's also very straightforward to generate corrections to this vertex. For example, if there's some heavy, heavy vector-like top quark, as you would have in composite Higgs models, you can typically make a diagram that looks like this with some kind of exchange here and get corrections to this vertex that are of the same percent level order with respect to the standard model. And in fact, in the mid-90s, um, this number was actually measured incorrectly due to, I think, the confusion of charm quarks for bottom quarks. And there was a large flurry of theoretical literature on how you could generate plus 3 and 4% corrections to this vertex uh, very straightforwardly in models of composite Higgs, Technicolor, et cetera. So this is now a very important constraint on physics beyond the standard model, something I think that Marcus Ludi will probably come back to in his talk. OK. Well, now um, we're doing good. Now we've talked about the SFs. Now I'd like to talk a little about the AFs. The AFs are very interesting because they have even more variation. A lepton has a 15% left-right asymmetry. A bottom quark has a essentially complete left-right asymmetry. And that's certainly something you'd like to be able to measure experimentally. So how can you do that? So the lepton asymmetry you can attack by various methods, um, all of which actually uh, deserve some comment. The first way is just to attack it directly, which was done by the experiments at the SLC. So these experiments achieved about 90% electron beam polarization. And then you could literally just measure the cross-section for a left-handed electron to make a z minus the cross-section for a right-handed electron to annihilate a positron and make a z divided by the sum of those quantities. And this is uh, supposed to be the A lepton. The actual experimental setup is very beautiful. Um, somewhere over here, uh, near, very close to the coastal range hills, there's the electron gun. So there you're shining a laser on a strained gallium arsenide target and trying to eject electrons with specific polarization. Um, then you have the three kilometer long slack accelerator. Then some transfer lines that add another kilometer and a half. And here's a detector. You uh, basically vary the polarization of the laser here in some random way, and you look for a correlated pattern here of changes in the rate of producing Zs. So very roughly, almost every systematic that you could imagine for this experiment cancels. And it's possible with the very small statistics of the Slack experiment to get a very accurate result, which, um, please excuse me, I did write down here somewhere. So this gave an AE of 0.1513 with an error of 0.21. The other ways that you can do this are to look at various final state particles. 
So one of them, for example, is the tau. Now the tau, we're very lucky, is a particle that decays through weak interactions in a way that we completely understand. This basically goes back to the things about V minus A that I told you yesterday, and it's a kind of practical application of that theory. For example, if I have a left-handed tau, um, that's going to decay, for example, to uh, a pion and the neutrino. The, um, the neutrino is always left-handed. The pion is spinless. So in the case where the tau is left-handed, the pion goes backwards in the tau frame, which means in the lab frame it'll be slow. If it's a right-handed tau, it, the pion goes forward just by angular momentum in the lab frame, and it'll be a, in the tau frame, and it'll be a fast pion in the lab frame. And it's not so hard to just plug in the V minus A theory and find that um, d sigma d cosine theta in the tau frame is one minus cosine theta. And this leads to a one minus z, uh, sorry, for a left-handed tau. And this leads to a one minus z distribution where z is the uh, energy of the pion divided by the energy of the tau in the lab. Similarly, if the tau decays leptonically, we saw that at the end point, when the lepton has its maximum value, it recoils against neutrinos that balance their spin. And so only the left-handed electrons survive out here. Or if you, so what that means is that the electron is fast for a left-handed tau, and it's going the other direction, so it'll be slow in the lab for a right-handed tau. And then you can work this out also for the other tau decay modes, the major decay modes, rho and A1. So all of these things were measured at LEP, and actually it's, it's really quite beautiful. Um, here is a characteristic tau event. So in the E plus E minus, in, at the LHC, taus are hard to find and quite subtle because there are you know, thousands of quark and gluon interactions for every tau. At an E plus E minus collider, the production is much more democratic and the tau events are extremely clean. In particular, this kind of one against three track topology um, is an indication that you're producing tau pairs. Uh, this event probably in the lower part has this decay, uh, tau to pion and the neutrino with a single pion track that you see there. So in the experiments, you separate out the various decay modes and you look at the energy distribution of visible products and here's what the data looks like. So, um, of course, it's slightly modified for the detector acceptance, but what you're seeing is in red, the one minus z, and in black, the one plus z distribution that you would expect for a right-handed tau. Uh, the red distribution has 15% more events, and so you can measure the asymmetry directly. In the right-hand side, you see the tau decay to a muon, and again, you see the muon spectrum is predicted to be harder for the left-handed tau than the right-handed tau. The black is a fit to the sum of those distributions. And as you see, it's really um, extremely well fit by that. And in the end, what you come to is, going all over the place, um, a number AE of 0.1465 with an error of 0.33. Uh, it's a little smaller than this one, but uh, quite consistent. Finally, you can try and, and measure this parameter from uh, flavor-dependent forward-backward asymmetries. So I wrote over here the angular distributions in E plus E minus. And this distribution has a forward-backward asymmetry, which is 3 quarters, or 0.75. This one, a forward-backward asymmetry, which is minus 3 quarters. And so by adding appropriate components, you can try to reconstruct the forward-backward asymmetry on the z-pole for a particular process. And in particular, if you have unpolarized electrons, <coughs> 
going to unpolarized FF bar, the forward-backward asymmetry on the Z resonance is that factor of three quarters, the polarization asymmetry for the electron, and the polarization asymmetry for F. A particular felicitous one, because you can find these events readily, is the AFB for B quarks. In that case, this number here is essentially maximal. And so it's supposed to be a very good measure for the AE. Um, the number that's found is uh, actually quite discrepant from the numbers over there, but it's still in the right ballpark um, for the standard model prediction, 0 0.40723. Um, the, it's, I'm, I should say, not understood why this number is not in good agreement with this number. And experimentalists arm wrestle about this. Uh, actually, it continues to be true. Um, eventually, we'll have a higher energy or a, actually a higher luminosity E plus E minus collider at the Z, and this will be resolved. But in any event, what you see is that the number of 14 or 15 percent um, really does confirm the fact that this number here in the table is rather low. On the other hand, one can go look at the bottom of the table where you get very large values of the asymmetry. There, the very interesting experiment to do a direct confirmation again came from the SLC. Because if you can produce a left-handed electron beam, the bottom quarks are supposed to be almost all left-handed. And so this should be a forward distribution, one plus cosine squared theta. If you had a right-handed electron beam, you should have a backward distribution. Um, you don't get exactly these distributions because it's not trivial experimentally to distinguish B from B bar, but there are tags that do that quite powerfully. And so what the data looks like coming out of the experiment is this. And yeah, it's really right. If you have an electron, a left-handed polarized electron beam, the distribution is strongly forward. If you have a right-handed polarized electron beam, the distribution just turns around and now it's all backward. And by the way, the difference in the normalization of these two distributions is an effect. That's another way of measuring AE and again reflects the 15% asymmetry that we talked about. So the number for, uh, please excuse me, the number for RB that comes out of this analysis is uh, 0.923 with an error in this decimal place. Actually, one can also, at the SLC, find uh, the charm quarks and measure the R for the charm quarks. It's much lower precision, um, but again, in good agreement with this number in the table. And so uh, it's really very interesting that one can try um, to really go through and measure every number in that table as well as you can and find agreement with the standard model, which let's just say is well beyond the accuracy of this table. It's really at the accuracy that requires one loop electroweak corrections, which have all been calculated. And uh, these numbers with their full precision are in good agreement with the fully precise theoretical calculations. Now there's one relatively new addition to the precision electroweak literature that's worth talking about, because this is the one that's really now going to be much improved in the future of the LHC. And that's the measurement of the W mass. The W mass, you would think the right way to measure that is to produce E plus E minus to W pairs, and then try to directly measure the mass of the two jet system that originates from a W in that environment. And that was done at uh, LEP, at the second stage of LEP, um, with about a, uh, I believe, 40 MeV accuracy on the uh, W mass. Um, the statistics of LEP was unfortunately very low. Uh, there was some decision to dismantle LEP to build a proton collider of some kind. 
And so uh, one didn't really reach the full statistics that one might imagine for this experiment. But on the other hand, it turns out to be possible to measure the W mass extremely accurately at hadron colliders. And this has already been demonstrated by the Tevatron experiments, uh, CDF and D0. And in particular, there's a guy at Duke named Ashtosh Kotwal, who's literally put his life into this and has achieved some really amazing results. He's a member of the CDF collaboration. And so I'd just like to show you a few uh, pieces of this analysis. So ordinarily, what you would think is that at a hadron collider, you make a W, which then decays, let's say, to an electron and the neutrino. The electron is precisely measured, or a muon here. The neutrino is, of course, invisible. And so as I showed you yesterday, you see events with only a lepton and basically nothing else in the event. And then from that, you have to reconstruct the W. Now, you can do that by making a theory of the transverse momentum distribu distribution of the W. I think um, of the lepton. I think here you see uh, that theoretical prediction um, nominally in the theory as a function of PT, the cross-section has, a, at leading order, a singularity at a point which is MW over 2. And then uh, various effects, including QCD, will round this into a shoulder. And so that's what's reflected in this distribution. However, there's a trick which makes it um, easier to do a very precise measurement. And that is to construct something called the transverse mass. So for the transverse mass, you work only in transverse quantities. And so what you would do is to do the following. You take the electron for which you've measured the full three momentum. The neutrino, you interpret the transverse part of the momentum is equal to the missing momentum when you've measured everything else in the event. So then you can construct the um, PE plus E mu vector, the transverse part, um, please excuse me, minus the, the transverse parts separately of the two momentum vectors. And one can prove that this is bounded above by MW. So what you get for this transverse mass distribution is a distribution which theoretically would have an endpoint at MW. And in fact, it turns out that the events are rather bunched up toward the endpoint. So in zeroth order, there's a sharp distribution. This is uh, smeared out a little by the W width and by some QCD effects. And one then gets not a distribution like this on a scale from 0 to 100, but the distribution on the previous slide, which please notice is now cut off at around 30 GeV. So the endpoint is much sharper, and you can use that theory to um, determine the W mass. Now, Unfortunately, to get the W mass to high accuracy, you have to do a very detailed in situ calibration of all of these quantities, the missing energy, the electron and muon momenta. And in the Tevatron experiments, there are all kinds of very interesting methods to use experimental data, to use the um, analogous quantity for the Z. Uh, of course, one knows the Z mass very accurately, as I told you from LEP, um, to uh, to do those momentum calibrations. And in the end, what you get is just a spectacularly accurate measurement of the W mass. So I think I put that here. Um, so this is now a summary of the current status of the Tevatron experiments. And um, 
please excuse me, what you see here is per experiment about a 20 MeV error on these quantities. When you put it together, it's about a 15 MeV total error on the W mass. The LEP number um, you see here, and I guess I quoted 40, it says 30 when you uh, do the composite. In any event, um, this measurement is the equal in terms of a constraint on the standard model of any of the LEP experiments that I discussed to you for the structure of the Z0. And again, um, it turns out to be a very beautiful confirmation of the precise value which is predicted in the standard model. OK, now um, we have about 15 minutes left. And I wanted to just say a few words about um, the use of electroweak data to constrain physics beyond the standard model in a kind of general analysis. So here, there's a notion which came up, someone asked me about yesterday, but I promised that today I would actually define it and discuss it, which is the notion of oblique electroweak corrections. And this is the following idea that um, I, I think is, it's not precise, but it's an idea that assists your thinking, I, I believe, in a very nice way. So there are lots of reasons to study physics beyond the standard model, but I think the most important one for me is the question of electroweak symmetry breaking. The, we postulate this Higgs boson. We'll talk a little more about that on Thursday. Is it an elementary particle? We postulate that it has a potential of the symmetry breaking form. Um, basically, in the standard model, we just write down some function and give the coefficients the correct sign so that the potential has that form. So we would like to know where that structure comes from. Is there a deeper theoretical explanation for why the Higgs has the potential it has and why the Higgs eventually does what it does, condensing into the vacuum and influencing any particle that goes through the vacuum of space. To do that, there are lots of theories, and those theories typically introduce new particles. And those new particles have the property that they must couple to SU2 cross U1, because ultimately they have to do something about the Higgs boson. But those particles needn't couple to light fermions, and of course, um, things that modify the Higgs sector typically must be very weakly coupled to the fermions that we typically do experiments with, electrons, up quarks, down quarks, et cetera. So if you start thinking about radiative corrections to some process, for example, let's think about the radiative corrections to, um, let's say, uh, lepton pair production the z width to go to a lepton pair, there are radiative corrections that come from new particles that can come in the vertex. For example, something like this. Um, so we could have some kind of heavy lepton here that would be mediated by uh, w. However, if the rationale for that lepton is to um, make modifications in the Higgs sector, probably the coupling here would be something like Me over ML, which would be an extremely small number. Um, in addition, uh, OK. So you can think of various ways to inject radiative corrections into processes like this from beyond the standard model physics. Uh, when you estimate the effect of those interactions, typically you find suppressions like this. And in the quark sector, as uh, Zoltan, I think, will explain to you, one literally can't introduce large numbers here artificially because various constraints from flavor physics tell you that such events can't be present except below a very low level. On the other hand, that heavy object can freely occur in a vacuum polarization because to occur in a vacuum polarization, it only has to couple to SU2 cross U1 and this contribution can be an order one radiative correction on the same, on the same level 
as one loop radiative corrections, let's say, that come from W bosons. And so it's interesting to try and make a theory of the effect of beyond the standard model on precision electroweak that uses this idea. We ignore the corrections to vertex diagrams and uh, box diagrams and concentrate on the corrections to vacuum polarization diagrams. Now, when you do that, um, we can now introduce one more idea, uh, which now is maybe more motivated than ever by the LHC experiments, which is that whatever new particles that we're introducing, they're going to be rather heavy. And so I'm going to assume that the mass of any new particle that we introduce is much larger than the z-mass. Uh, many of you know that this is not actually required by the LHC data, but it's required, as it were, prima facie. You need some special circumstances in order for the LHC not to exclude new particles that are at 100 GeV. So in this way, um, we can think about taking the various vacuum polarization diagrams in the electroweak theory and just tailor expanding them in momenta because we're always going to evaluate them at momenta much lower than the scale of the new particles that we introduce. Now, there are four vacuum polarizations that appear, namely the uh, photon, the photon Z mixing, the Z vacuum polarization, and the W vacuum polarization. And as we do a Taylor expansion, there's pi of zero and pi prime of zero. And the first corrections will be here. I'm going to ignore pi double prime of zero. Now, QED, the gauge symmetry is exact. And that requires this vacuum polarization to vanish at q squared equals zero. So this is actually not present, and this is not present. And so if we tailor expand to this level, there are only six amplitudes that appear. And so now we're definitely making some progress. There are six quantities that, in this view of oblique electroweak corrections, can be modified by new physics. And then we can try and put them together into some theory. Now, there are two more things that you need to um, understand to make this theory more complete. The first thing is to remember that at the tree level, electroweak theory has these three fundamental parameters within the standard model, g, g prime, and v. Those quantities are not known a priori, and they're all renormalizable quantities. So we have to determine them from experiments. And I think a particularly clear way of thinking about this is to say there are going to be three reference values, uh, very accurate experimental numbers, that we're going to use in order to determine these three parameters. And then everything else potentially is free. Um, at the time this theory was made, those parameters were alpha of mz, uh, g fermi, and mz. So, each of these quantities is known uh, to about the 10 to the minus 5 level. Actually, G Fermi, I think, to the 10 to the minus 6 level. Alpha is known very precisely, but what you need is the value of alpha at mz. So you need to evolve that with the renormalization group from q squared equals 0 up to q squared of order mz. That's actually the major source of error in this quantity. Today, in view of, the, of this slide, you might think about replacing this by MW and building a different theory, but I'm going to here just talk about the traditional one. Okay. okay, so then in terms of these numbers, we can define a reference value of sine squared theta W, sine squared theta W zero by the following formula. Sine squared two theta W zero is alpha of MZ divided by the square root of 2 g Fermi mz squared. And this number is, again, about 0.231. OK. So now, let's say that you have some precision electroweak observable. For example, the, um, the leptonic asymmetry. So 
Um, the leptonic asymmetry or any asymmetry can be used to define a value of sine squared theta w by using the tree level formula. Um, let's remember this is a half minus sine squared theta w plus minus sw squared divided by the sum. This is, when you, if you ignore small terms, basically uh, 8 times a quarter minus sw. And let me call this sw star. And in a similar way, the other asymmetries that you see here, and also these rates that go into the Z physics depend on this on-shell um, Z coupling S star. So we can try and write formulae for the accurately measured um, standard model parameters, M and S star. And so to do that, what you have to do is the following. You have to, first of all, write down the diagrams that directly contribute to these quantities. So for example, if you have a Z photon interference here, then that will affect the asymmetry of this vertex, because now instead of being a chiral vertex, it's a vector-like vertex. So it slightly shifts the asymmetry. However, if you compute only those diagrams, you don't get a finite result, because somehow you have to take into account the renormalization of these basic electroweak parameters. So there are going to be subtractions in the result that are generated by some other diagrams. And so in particular, to analyze this quantity, you have to compute these uh, Z photon interference diagrams. And you have to compute all the diagrams, gamma, gamma, w, w, and ZZ that come into the calculation of these quantities so you can make the correct changes in the counterterms. When you do that, what you find is that the answers are given in terms of combinations of these six vacuum polarization diagrams. And those combinations are ultraviolet finite in a normalizable theory. And um, they would affect then the arbitrary influence that new physics has. And conventionally, those combinations are given some names, S, T, and U. So let me write them down here. S is uh, pi, oh, let's see. I need to introduce some notation first. So um, let me consider the currents three, which is the third component of isospin, Q, which is the thing that the electric charge couples to, and one, which is the one component of isospin. Then the photon-photon vacuum polarization is I'm going to call pi QQ of Q squared. The photon Z vacuum polarization is E squared over CW SW pi 3Q minus S squared pi QQ. So this is the I3 minus S squared Q coupling of the Z. And similarly for Z and the W, I think it's just easiest to write it as pi 1, 1 of Q squared, so that you can see now how uh, the SU2 custodial symmetry is going to come in. In terms of those quantities, you can then define S as pi 3, 3 of MZ squared minus pi 3, 3 of 0 minus pi 3, Q of MZ squared. And this quantity, it turns out, is finite in a renormalizable theory. And there's a quantity T, which is defined in this way. Pi 1, 1 of 0 minus pi 3, 3 of 0. And there's a quantity U, which I'll describe in a moment. Now, these quantities are, are very nice in terms of, as it were, distinguishing different origins of new physics. T is explicitly custodial SU2 violating. It differentiates the 1, 1 and the 3, 3 components 
of the vector boson vacuum polarization. So things that violate custodial symmetry will give contributions to here. This is also proportional to the thing called the rho parameter. Um, the coefficients, by the way, give these uh, quantities a contribution of order one from one loop corrections. This quantity respects custodial symmetry, and it basically has to do with the first derivative of the vacuum polarization as you go away from zero. So it's in the effect of explicitly new things at high uh, mass. And U is a combination that um, I believe has pi 1, 1 of m w squared here analogously to this. So this one has both the derivative with respect to q squared and the violation of custodial symmetry. And it's typically very small compared to these two in modifications of the standard model by new particles. Well, what's nice about these expressions is that these three expressions are the unique combinations of these three, six quantities that are free of um, ultraviolet divergences and that are basically orthogonal to the combinations to the renormalist, to the calculation of these quantities from observable quantities. And so one can then write extremely simple formulae, um, which I was about to do here. So MW over MW squared over MZ squared, at tree level, that's cosine squared theta W. So in leading order, that will be equal to the cosine theta squared theta w that you would derive from this formula. And then radiative corrections would generate a correction of the following kind. Similarly, the value of sine squared theta w that governs the z asymmetries would be equal to this in leading order and it would be modified if there are corrections from new particles beyond the standard model. And again, you can work out the formula. It looks something like this. And now, if you um, have the measurements of these quantities over here, you can then compare them to the reference value and fit for S and T and get constraints on literally any kind of new physics that you want to postulate within the bounds of this general idea that the corrections are oblique, that they're not coupling directly to light fermions, but only coming from physics beyond this, only coming from basically physics that affects the Higgs sector. So here is the current status of the fit to those quantities. Now, let me just talk a little about how um, various known parameters of the standard model affect these quantities. Um, one interesting observation is that Top and Higgs basically obey rather strongly this oblique assumption. And so they give corrections both to S and T. For the top quark, the effect is logarithmic in the top quark mass. For the T parameter, the effect is actually quadratic in the top quark mass. So this is, again, a situation where um, we're seeing radiative corrections enhanced by a factor of mt squared over mw squared. I'm going to talk a lot about that phenomenon tomorrow. Um, for the Higgs, both effects are logarithmic. Over in z squared. And so if here is your standard model value in the ST plane, Increasing the top quark mass is a, actually, it turns out to be an enormous excursion in that direction. And increasing the Higgs mass turns out to take you along a curve like that, which is, again, an order one excursion in S and T. And 
up on this slide, I have the current constraints on S and T from the current precision electroweak fit. Um, and actually, the constraints are rather strong. S is minus 0.05. This is the fit of the G-fitter group, uh, plus or minus uh, 0 0.11. T is minus 0 0.09, again, perfectly consistent with the standard model with an error of about 0.1. For comparison, one heavy SU2 cross U1 doublet turns out to make a delta S of about uh, 0.05. So it's just barely consistent with this. And a heavy generation would be a delta S of 0.2, which is already excluded at 2 sigma by the current bound on S that I've written here. So, sorry? Oh, yeah, I have it multiplied by 3. This would just be a lepton doublet. So, um, in general, uh, new physics will contribute at this kind of 10, 10 to the minus 1 level to S and T. And in fact, if you have a, a composite Higgs model that typically has both structure in the Higgs field and some new vector like fermion partners, you can easily get larger values. So this kind of general constraint is probably the strongest constraint on building Randall Sundrum or uh, uh, composite Higgs models. This again is something that Marcus Ludi will talk about in his lectures. So, uh, well, it's probably time I stop, but um, that's the theory of precision electroweak interactions. And I think it's something that you need to carry in your head because these incredibly beautiful experiments are very powerful, not only in telling us that SU2 cross U1 is really right, in a sense maybe even stronger than what we would have expected, but it also puts strong constraints on what can happen at the next level that you need to constantly keep in mind. Okay, thank you very much.